This is the Germont British News, presenting the world to the world. Notabilities of the film and literary world attended a foils luncheon at which the chairman was Mr. J. Arthur Reck. Film critic Dillis Powell and that other distinguished writer Mr. James Agate were the two speakers. Stuart Granger and Margaret Lockwood were among the guests of honour to be introduced by Mr. Reck. Well, I asked Miss Powell to speak. I'd like to present to you the, the guests of honour. We have three here. <coughs> Miss Margaret Lockwood. <laughs> Mr. Stuart Granger. And Mr. Lee Golden. Now I'll ask Miss Powell to speak to you. Now, what are the qualifications for a critic? I think that members of my profession are often attacked for being too severe. Now, I do think that the very first qualification of a critic is to like the art he's writing about. And if a critic errs on the side of severity, it is not that he is a sincere and good critic because he doesn't like what he's writing about. He is severe because he likes it and because he respects it and because he expects good things of it. Yeah. Following on, Mr. Agit raised plenty of laughs in describing the functions of the crit. Well, I am a practicing dramatic critic and not a theorist. Mr. Rank produces a picture. That's his job. I say this is a damn good picture or this picture is awful. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. And there I stop. I know nothing about the function of criticism. <laughs> Visiting Czechoslovakia, members of a British trade union delegation were greatly impressed by the country's post-war industrial drive. Plenty of chances were given for chats with workers engaged in every kind of production. It's all part of a two-year reconstruction plan, and Czechoslovakia certainly seems happy about the way it's working out. Arriving at 10 Downing Street, Mr. Jinnah, spokesman for 94 million Muslims, prepares for talks with the Prime Minister, Cabinet members and the other Indian delegates. The Viceroy, Lord Wavell, has also been playing a prominent part in the meetings, but in spite of strenuous efforts to reach agreement, the talks again seem doomed to failure. Sad news from Stratford-on-Avon, with a serious fire which gutted a large part of the town hall, destroying priceless relics and documents carefully preserved for hundreds of years. Only part of the frame now remains of the magnificent Gainsborough portrait of David Garrick, valued at nearly 40,000 pounds. With the people of Stratford-on-Avon, we grieve for the loss of an irreplaceable part of English history. Top hats, breeches, and the biggest collection of whiskers seen for a hundred years were the order of the day in Cambridge's most hilarious rag, a football match with a difference. This version is known as foot the ball, and after a final glance at the book of rules, the light blues are quite ready to meet the opposing team from Oxford. Even the spectators were heavily camouflaged, particularly about the face, and plenty of local colour is provided by a band that would have shaken great-grandpapa to the core. And now a great moment as the stalwart Cambridge team bound onto the field, with their opponents, the sportsmen of Oxford, making an equally brave show, and top hats ten a penny. Cameramen of the 1840s get the crowd to watch the birdie, which must have had some very nasty shocks. <laughs> Solemn beneath yards of false hair, the two captains spin the coin and the game begins. Just to complicate matters, three footballs are used at once, each of a different colour and anyone guilty of heading the ball without first removing his hat is severely frowned upon by the referee. 
no wonder the strain sometimes proved too great. No, this isn't slow motion, it's just part two of the game, taken at walking pace and guaranteed to baffle even a Stanley Matthews. Here's one of the forward line, hot on the trail and just dying to run. Anyway, walking or not, it's another girl for somebody, and the final score of Cambridge 6, Oxford 4, meant that drinks were on the dark blue. <laughs> Latest addition to London's underground system is the central line extension from Liverpool Street to Stratford. The Minister of Transport, Mr Alfred Barnes, opened the line by turning a golden key which changed the signal lights and unveiled the new stretch of line which cost over three million pounds to complete. To round off the ceremony, the minister, his wife and officials of London Transport were taken for a ride by the senior driver who once worked on the old Tuppany tube. Mr Barnes enjoys a smoke on the way to Stratford and the end of the run. Taking its place in London's vast network, the new line now enters the service of the public, who will add to their own comfort, by the way, if they remember that warning and stagger their hours of travel if they can.